The melt up in markets has a lot to unwind should the COVID scare stick. Welcome back to another weekend video. My name is Justin and this weekend we're going to try to answer whether or not we need to be worried about this new variant that has surfaced in South Africa or whether or not the market's going to be able to shake this off and continue to go higher. So uh, last weekend we did a we did a video talking about how uh, the stock market uh, crash was going to potentially happen between now and the end of the year. What we were also looking for were the warning signs that the stock market was crashing, not crashed. Uh. And uh, we called it pretty accurately. So this weekend, as a follow up, we want to try to just ask ourselves whether or not we're going to keep going lower or higher. Meaning, what now? Now what? What do we do from here? That's the most important question this week. So. Try to, gonna try gonna try to get that done in about 30 minutes here and at any point if you are enjoying the content I would really appreciate a uh, thumbs up please and thank you subscribing to the channel also make sure that you receive the video every single weekend smashing the bell make sure you don't miss it so just gonna read this first article here and what I want to actually focus on is gonna be a lot of economic data before we move forward to the charts and everything else everyone knows the stock market crashed this week so there's a little there's a little uh, less value in jumping to the charts immediately because we want to try, we want to try to unpack what is the stock market going to focus on this next week and we got something very important here with Jerome Powell the new Fed chair renominated for a second term through 2026 is going to be speaking on Monday morning Monday afternoon tentatively on Tuesday and on Wednesday that is a lot of Jerome Powell right we like Jerome Powell so let's hear the man talk and see what he has to say uh, because he's going to be giving one two three four separate testimonies here sorry three testimonies and then one speaking engagement the market's going to really want some assurance from this dr money sugar papa uh, sugar daddy papa powell why um we have we have a new variant which emerged and he steered us through the pandemic so he has continuity for the markets um, he keeps the Fed insulated from politics, and the stock market just trusts this guy. So I think that uh, what he has to say this week is going to be ultra important. Um, what I want to take a moment here to fully appreciate is just that um, the stock market loves certainty. So we say it over and over and over, but what we can look at here is that the stock market now has uh, the certainty that Jerome Powell is going to be the head of the Fed through 2026. Again, uh, if he gets confirmed by the Senate, which there's every reason to assume that he will be. And then uh, Joe Biden is the president. So what does that mean? Joe Biden will be president for at least three more years. And Jerome Powell is going to be the Fed chair for four more years. So what does this mean? Well, under Joe Biden, we have a record setting presidential gain after 12 months. What does that mean? He's number one, literally the number one. Um, the S&P just capped its best year ever following a U.S. presidential election, election, surging 37% since Joe Biden won the vote. So Joe Biden here in 2020 delivered 37.4%. That goes all the way back to 1930s and 40s for similar returns in that 30% area. Bill Clinton, uh, the most recent person to uh, to get to that get to that 30% uh, area, was in 1996. Yeah, that's quite a while ago. Obama had 24 and then uh, Trump had 21. So what we want to keep in mind here is that I think the reason why the market's been able to continue to go higher is because these two guys at the top, Jerome Powell and Joe Biden. So the stock market knows that jo uh, Joe Biden is not going to surprise the market, meaning he's not going to tweet. Again, he's boring, predictable. They call him Sleepy Joe. That's exactly what the stock market wants. Someone who is boring, predictable, and not going to throw a monkey wrench inside the machine. Jerome Powell, um, again, also, uh, right, continuity for the markets. He steered us through the pandemic, so we have to assume that what he said so far is what he's going to keep doing. This guy has been very solid, very reliable. What has he been? Predictable. Exactly what the stock market likes. So what I was trying to figure out are what are the reasonable questions he's going to be asked on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then, then when we get the data on Thursday with initial jobless claims, and then that big number coming out on Friday, non-farm payroll, unemployment rate, unemployment rate, and then ISM non-manufacturing. The reason why this all matters is because, again, one more time, like last week where we were looking for the Fed meeting minutes to potentially provide some insight for where, 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 where we were going to be going and how to interpret, interpret the data, the man himself, Jerome Powell, is going to be telling us how to interpret the data and what we need to focus on for uh, probably the next uh, couple of months here. So 
Non-farm payroll is going to be uh, part of the second mandate from the Fed for price stability and full employment. But then looking down here, we got ISM non-manufacturing non PMI. This is not the, the favorite uh, gauge from the Fed. That one comes out on December 10th, which is going to be the PCE or the uh, right the uh, consumer price index. So over here, PMI or producers manufacturing index is a telltale sign or a preview for what's going to be happening to the CPI. And here we are expecting a tick down versus the previous uh, previous report that would be bullish unemployment rate would also be ticking down and then non-farm payroll is expected to tick up what is that that's bullish data we can also note here that initial jobless claims are expected to expected to tick higher a little bit but all said and done this is positive data so what jerome powell is likely also going to have to face this week when he testifies and gives his speeches are what is going to happen with this new variant he said the whole time that the risk was uh not being prepared for it. So a couple of headlines here, we're just gonna go through really fast. Again, Joe Biden, again, Sleepy Joe, the stock market loves that, it loves when this guy falls asleep. He was uh, he was giving some, uh, some speech remarks on Friday after the stock market crashed, and we're gonna go through that in a moment here. And again, if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate a thumbs up and drop me a comment. Do you agree with these comments? Do you like a sleepy president? And uh, do you like people at the top who are reliable, predictable, whether uh, whether or not you are Republican or Democrat, the stock market does like it. So again, please drop me a comment and let me know. Have we crashed? Is the crash over? And now what? What are we going to do from here? Up, down, all around, going to go sideways? You tell me. All right. So now we're going to jump down to these next articles here. So again, at the top, we've got people who are boring, predictable, and reliable. So if we see more of that this week, I think the stock market is going to take that as a cue that we're in a liquidity-driven rally with a bill back better expected to pass before December, and Jerome Powell's at the top. He's going to turn that tap back on if needed. That's what I expect. The markets also started to uh, bake in a forward uh, rate hike into 2022, and uh, what that means is that it would be a surprise if we walked back those expectations. Uh, Goldman Sachs is now calling for a rate hike in July. And we're seeing that uh, right the, uh, the the Fed funds uh, rate is now expected to have a rise as early as May, meaning in the spring. So the market's already done a lot of the work here to uh, um, to oh I forgot one more article here. Um, there's one more thing I actually want to go through. So um, I forgot about this. this. is actually really important. So what was I saying? Um, anyways, let's just jump forward to this because I think that. What's going to be really important here is uh, just this one tweet that I went through a little bit earlier this week. So um, Jerome Powell is going to be talking and the ECB is already signaled that they're ready, willing and able to print more. What does that mean? ECB's Panetta says continued monetary stimulus is necessary. If we lose patience now, we will put at risk everything we have achieved so far. This was tweeted out two days before we heard about that Omicron, Omicron variant. So what does that mean? Uh, Jerome Powell is, uh, is able to actually walk back the uh, expectation that we're going to be having a, uh, a rate hike sooner than later. Maybe it's going to come into the later part of 2022. And uh, we hear everyone, uh, again, including Bostic on Friday, talking about they would be ready and willing to accelerate the taper. But remember, these guys have been voted off the island. They're not going to be on the FOMC or Federal Open Market Committee in 2022. If you're not sure what that means, I would encourage you to click on the link uh, in the description or that's gonna pop up over here to watch last weekend's video where we go through and talk about the FOMC 2022 or next season on the Fed, right? Who's gonna be, who's gonna be on the team? Who's gonna get voted off the island? Um, again, I'm trying to make a little bit of fun because that's what it seems like. Um, I heard a really funny commentary uh, this week that there's never been as much drama about who is gonna be the head of the Fed it kind of feels like uh, Game of Thrones, where every previous time, including Alan Greenspan, he served for like 20, 30 years. There was never a question as to whether or not he was going to be the Fed chair. This time, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty. I think that because the Senate is still uh, Republican controlled, that Joe Biden probably wanted to push uh, Lael Brainard in there, but he probably would not have been able to get her confirmed. Why? The midterms are after the uh, Feb February of 2022, when the uh, the current sitting Fed chair, Jerome Powell, would be uh, leaving the job if that was the case, which means that it's really good that the Senate is still controlled by the Republicans if you like Jerome Powell. Otherwise, he probably wouldn't be there. All right, what I want to what I jump down, what I want to jump down next to is going to be what caused this headline here. And 
Is there evidence to support the bull thesis and the bear thesis? And what is Jerome Powell likely going to be facing for questions when he testifies this week? All right, so I just have a couple of things highlighted because I don't want to go through and read the whole article. I encourage you to click on the link in the description if you want to join us for uh, our Slack group. This is all inside the SPX channel where everything is summarized and laid out as clear and simple as I can. So um, rich valuations, e uh, ebullient sentiment makes stock uh, vulnerable. Potential to be a game changer. Uh, one reason the, uh, the first crash was so brutal back in March 2020 was all the froth that built up in the markets before the virus landed. Uh, while, while there are differences for traders navigating the latest scare, a lot is the same. Comfort, comfort that investors found in solid economic data, which we're going to be getting this week. Uh, robust earnings and an accommodative Federal Reserve. Um, views from the perspective viewed from the perspective of valuations, the stock market is notably more stretched than it was in 2020 turning point. What does that mean? Uh, we're at a point where if the market wants to sell off, the uh, the whole recipe is there. The charts are there, um, the option interest is there, and uh, all we need is pretty much that confirmation. So I think that um, it's going to be very interesting where we start the week, but also where we end the week. Why? It's going to be a jam packed week with Jerome Powell. So that's the most important thing, just understanding that the stage is set. If we're going to go lower, um, that means that the market uh, is knows these people at the top are, are per boring, predictable, stable, but still want to sell off anyway. Again, notably Jerome Powell and Joe Biden. Um, this is an article here from uh, Joe Biden. And again, this is from Bloomberg, the source that I trust to get my news from. I don't particularly like CNBC as much. I prefer Bloomberg. So melt up uh, has a lot of a lot to unwind should the uh, scare stick, and then uh, Biden talked inflation with Fed upcoming uh, picks for uh, to share concern, and this is where uh, it's very interesting because when we look at the screenshot here, um, again Joe Biden blah 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 right. Um, I have talked to the Fed about a whole range of things from monetary policy to inflation, and I have and I have confidence that the appointees I've made and I'm going to have three more. Um, or going to reflect that concern. Again, we know there's three coming. We did that research for last weekend. And uh, again, he, de uh, he declined uh, to elaborate on when or who, why. He needs to figure out who's going to be on his dream team, right? Who's going to be on the fantasy team for 2022? Who? Who's going to be on the island? Who's going to be voted off? All right, here we go. Um, Biden last week, uh, so... Uh, Biden last week announced he would be uh, reappointing blah, 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 while the country is grappling with its fastest rising prices in 30 years. Biden shrugged off the market slump. As we noted before, the market loves Joe Biden. And if he's not worried about this, why are we? Um, expected. They always do when stocks or when uh, COVID rises, he says. Asked if he is worried. Uh, after worried, he said, not at all. Why? He's the number one. He's the number one president for the stock market. In the first 12 months, he's number one ever. Number one ever, ever, ever. All right. Very interesting. All right. So next thing we're going to look at here is just understanding the uh, potential for this variant. Should we be worried about it? Should we be a little bit less concerned? And this is from, again, uh, right, the uh, C Word Daily from Bloomberg as well. I have a snapshot here. I encourage you to click on that email to expand and read it if you want to see the full synopsis. But here we're talking to an expert. And what he's saying is that, again, what I'm, what I'm pulling out here is just the most important part. If you want to read the whole thing, please do. It's just very difficult to get the video down to 30 minutes if I go through each line by line and read everything. Um, the Delta variant, when it was first discovered, also raised all these questions. Can you help put some context in this? How does this compare with, this, with the situation in the early days of Delta? Uh, what we discovered from Delta, that it was, uh, it was obviously more contagious. Uh, the severity of disease was about the same, and it did not evade the protection of our vaccines. So what does that mean? Again, there's three things here. There's the severity. There's the spreadability and then also the vaccine. So uh, just reading through here, uh, we're in the same position now as we were with the new variant. What does that mean? We don't know. There were two cases that were discovered today on Saturday, the 27th in the UK. But the best part this time is that there's no education required. Uh, the, the, the travel between these countries locked down almost immediately. So I would assume that even if it's worse, we're probably able to contain it a lot better than before. And I think the initial knee-jerk reaction has the potential to start to level off. I'm hoping, right? I'm hoping. It's also flu season, so let's be honest. People do get the flu and sick during flu season, so I don't know why people are so concerned. But uh, reading the last part here, 
Um, we're at the beginning of the holiday travel season, and with many people anxious to spend time with family after skipping travels last year, how should people be thinking about travel and gathering in light of this new development? The doctor said that they're expecting to see their son, uh, who, who they've not seen for two years, and uh, they're still planning for this. We should assume that nothing's going to go wrong, but be ready, willing, and able to adjust if needed. What does that mean? Don't stop living your life. Um, there's no reason why right now we need to be overly concerned. Again, I hope and I pray that I am right. All right, now we want to jump here to an article from CNBC, which again, this one popped up and I'm like, okay, well, this seems pretty timely and pretty important. The current inflation run is similar to other episodes in history, but with one important difference. So the difference is that, um, right, we're going to go through and find out what that is. So let's go through here. Um, did I not actually share that screenshot that had the, uh, let me actually see here. Oops. Uh, let me go to the article here, actually. I, normally, I haven't been trying to like keep these open here, but I'll just, uh, I'll share this one in the thread as well. Let's go here. Um, what I want to show is actually just the graph. So episodes of U.S. inflation. When we look at graphs as technicians or people who like to uh, be familiar with lines, what we can see here is that, so what, right? So what? Um, these lines don't really seem all that bad to me. Um, why? This is a self-inflicted wound. So let's see what happens here, right? Look at the shock in the 70s. That's what we're comparing it to right now, where inflation right now was at about 5%. What if we go up to 15? Yeah, we survived that before. Three times higher. Three. Not one, not two. Three times higher. So let's just be mindful of that. And I share this article down here at the bottom too, just to make sure I don't forget. Um, but what I, pulled, what I pulled through from here is one important detail. So let's have a look here. How it all ends. Again, I just pulled through the part of the article that I found the most relevant. So um, blah, 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 right? Uh, Chief Moody's analyst. Again, this guy seems pretty reputable. Feels that the uh, feels that way, even though he says there are, there are close parallels between the current predicament and the runaway inflation of the 1970s. For one, he said the waves and that inflation shock were both demand-driven and the product of supply issues because of the oil embargoes back then. Again, instead of oil embargoes this time, we're having supply issues because of the global uh, supply chain being shut down, potentially not going back online until 2023, um, fully back to normal into 2023. Unions that have been able to negotiate cost of living increases or COLA, cost of living allowances, in contracts also boosted the wage price spiral. A sentient Fed also contributed to the problems by taking inflation too lightly. So again, there's the dual-edged sword here where there's the risk of the unknown with the new variant. And how do we tow those lines? What does Jerome Powell have to say? His words are very powerful. So I'll be listening very closely to what he has to say this week. Why? We're going into winter. So is the printer coming or are we going to stay the course and taper faster? The wage spiral that we suffered back then was because of the COLAs, again, cost of living allowances, and the explosion uh, explosion if inflation in expl inflation expectations. I'm assuming that's a typo. They did rise, and the Fed did not recognize that and did not respond to it. So again, the last part here is that assuming each future wave of the virus is less dis disruptive, then yeah, I think we would see signs of moderation. So I don't think we're going to get three times the inflation that we have right now. I personally think that we're starting to see the tail end of it. But there is some evidence here that based on what happened in the 1970s, there are some rumblings. What? Notably, Deer. Deer proves it can afford to give its workers a raise. What does that mean? Let's have a look here. So it's a good thing for Deer that the company was able to come on an agreement with its striking workforce. Again, a union. And what are they fighting for? Higher prices, COLA, cost of living allowance. We can't afford life anymore. You got to pay us more. So with the striking workforce be uh, before the agricultural equipment giant reported its latest earnings, the update leaves no doubt that the company can afford to pay its employees a lot more. Okay. Looking at the second part here. Um, so the company is also flexing its pricing power with an eye-popping 9% increase plan for its larger tractors and combined unit next year. What does that mean? They're passing the price on to everybody. They're consumers. Who? People who grow food. Yeah. What's going to happen to the price of your food? It's probably going to go higher. Why? They're charging 9% more for their equipment. The, the farmers aren't going to just eat that cost. So Deer is raising prices so they can also afford to pay their employees more. And that's just for unions. So as we noted in that previous article, it was the unions who fought for this. However, are these companies unionized? 
Uh, most of them don't want to be. Notably Amazon. What are they doing? They're giving extra prices without being forced to. Why? They're competing for talent. If they want to get people to work for them, if they don't want to go and someone else is paying more, they have to raise the ante. They got to up the price. So what does that mean here? Starting wages for retail is up to $17. Does that not seem like inflation to you? So again, I'm watching for what are the things that Joe Biden, sorry, yeah, Jerome Powell might be asked for as he gives the testimony. Last thing here. Um, so again, so what I'm looking at here, I forgot to mention this. So something I've been hearing as a new potential mandate from the Fed. And again, uh, the reason why I say that is because um, over here uh, for Lael Brainerd, we have could expand policy mandate. That is not currently expected from Jerome Powell. I think what they were talking about here was minorities, meaning, meaning uh, again, people of uh, disadvantaged uh, backgrounds being uh, give, given equal opportunity and then also climate change. However, I don't think that the market is quite predicting that Jerome Powell might actually have another mandate. Again, the dual mandate is price stability and full employment. No inflation or reasonable inflation and people have jobs. So if those two things are met, something that I found very interesting that I heard this week was a third mandate where they might want to have a third mandate for equity stability. Why? Let's read this one more time here. This is from the ECB. ECB has been moving ahead of the Fed, which means that the Fed is benefiting from, from someone else moving first, right? It's a game of chicken. And the ECB has been moving first. They removed accommodation. They added it back. Could it not be reasonable that the U.S. would do the same thing with all the stuff coming to light now? I think so. Why? If we lose patience now, we will put at risk everything we have achieved so far. What does that sound like? Sounds like another mandate. Sounds like a mandate for what? Equity market stability. Ah, Interesting, 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 interesting for sure. All right, well, that is a lot of data to unpack. Now let's go through the rest here. So now we're gonna go through and have a look at, uh, what do we wanna have a look at first here? We're gonna have a look at uh, ETF and calendars, uh, sorry, ETF and indicators. So what I wanna do now is actually try to understand with all of that as the backdrop, where do the charts actually sit right now? I'm at about 22 minutes right now. I'm gonna start going a little bit faster, encourage you to. Pause the video and replay it if needed. And uh, is my monitor still actually on there? Yeah, it looks like nothing's cut off. All right, perfect. We're going to go through the ETFs now. Again, these are ETFs and indicators. So what we're looking for here is evidence on the charts to support whether or not we're ready for a bigger cut or if we're going to go higher. So QQQ, what's important here is that we've got a higher high and a lower low. What does that mean? Uh, we don't know. Close of the low of the week. Still above 390, 387 is a key pivot, and then 383 is the previous all-time high after that. What does that mean? If we lose 387, I would assume we're going to hit at least 383. All the other charts we're going to look at following here are already backtesting that previous top. So what does that mean? If we fall below 383, that is bad for the bulls. It means the S&P is not able to shake things off, and the entire market is going lower. Tech was able to shrug off a lot of it, but it's not... Uh, it's not immune to having things go lower. It was a one-day move on Friday where we saw names like Zoom, uh, DocuSign, Netflix, and uh, Roblox going higher. So if it's not a one and done, we're gonna have to see continuation for the work from home trade, catching a bids in the, in, in the face of everything else going lower. Notably financial. So QQQ was down by 3% on Friday. XLF on Friday was down by... Uh, Oops, that's on the week. Anyways, look, look, closing at the low of the week here, XLF, if it gets back above 39 on a weekly closing basis, in my opinion, that is a bounce and a reversal attempt off the previous all-time high. There's a typo in there, my bad. So again, there's that previous all-time high that we're looking at uh, for QQQ to get tested if the slide continues and pretty much confirming the uh, S&P is not going to be able to shake it off. 37.5, uh, if we have a continued decline, would be the next target at 37.5. So that's our 61% Fibonacci retracement. Looking next, next year at XLV, XLV actually held up really well. Um, it is currently throttling that previous all-time high on a cup and handle or an inverse head and shoulders. What does that mean? It's actually pretty resilient here. Most of its decline is actually coming on Friday, half of it. Moving forward, so if we lose that top, um, again, back test the previous top already, back testing the next top, I think this is what the larger market wants to do. Why? 
one more time. If we lose patience now, we will put at risk everything we've achieved so far. This is Sparta. This is QQQ 400. Let's go. This is the stonk market. Stonks can't go down, not for three weeks in a row. What is wrong? Three weeks of red. What is wrong? Three more weeks of red for IWM. Oof, stinky. Uh, 50 MA held on a closing basis. So this is where I think a lot of these other charts could head if they don't hold up. Why? Tried to back test and hold the previous top with a wick. Huge, there, that's a red dildo, which means there's no wicks, right? Stomped, fell back inside the range, and then a fresh stomp to start the week off. It was already weak before Friday. It declined by 4% on Friday, which is a huge cut. But what's notable here is that it was able to actually uh, uh, set a rally into the close on Friday to hold that 50 MA. So I look at the DIA as a template potentially matching what IWM will if we're going to go lower. Why? If travel restrictions remain in place and the Delta fear is real, I think that DIA is going to lose that 349 to 350 area and dive down to 340, basically matching what IWM did right now, right? Dive down to that 50 MA and the uptrend and uh, the psychological next level. And I think that's going to be really important here. Look what happened to IWM when it did its move. It tried to bounce off the 50 MA and then just dove, right? Nice wick on the lower lower part here, though. So the same thing could kind of happen to DIA. I'm watching really close. RSP or equal weight S&P is already doing what uh, IWM did where it's poking below the previous top. It's not quite holding. It's poking below. It's inside the range. 152 and then uh, about 147 uh, below that. So potentially up to 10 more points. Uh, next one looking here, we're, we're going to look at is XLE. Everyone's talking about oil this week and energy declining. It closed green on the week. What's the big problem? Closed up by a uh, dollar or 1.6%. Still range bound, lower high, lower low, and the 200 MA held on a closing basis. What is that? That's a uh, bull break. It's testing the previous range here. Looks, looks fine to me. NYSC. Uh, again, NYSC looks a lot like DIA and IWM like we just reviewed. Second previous top has now been tested. This one here was not enough. We're going for the next one here. And uh, below that, we got about 16,000 as the 50 MA. Again, 50 weekly moving average. Next one here is going to be XLU or utilities. Not spared during the decline. Nothing was spared. Gold down. Bitcoin down. Uh, utilities down. Tech down. Uh, treasuries down. Everything down. Everything decline. All right, 27 minutes. Better start going faster. XLU right on the apex decision next week. I'm assuming up. Why? why? I think we're just going to go up. Um, that's what I think for utilities. I think we're going to go up. EEM or emerging markets, that is a bear break. We go all the way back here to about uh, 2007, 2008. One, so one, two, bull break, and then we get the descending triangle and the break. So we got three lower lows consecutively. I don't know what's going to happen. Just watching closely. Um, why? Well, again, uh, the virus is coming from the emerging markets. So, right, so, uh, let's see what happens. FXI or China, uh, bear break. Um there is a, oops, uh, yeah, stink, right? What a stinky chart here. Oof, right? Stinky. 38.2 IHS neckline. If we start, uh, keep declining below 38.2, looking for that relative low to get tested, the 52-week low. TNX or the 10-year treasury note. We got a cup and handle slash inverse head and shoulders with a 50, 50 MA or the yellow line as the neckline. Range bound between 14 and 16. Again, this basically tells us that we're range bound between 1.4 and 1.6% on the 10-year note. Goldman Sachs' end, your tar end of your target is 1.6. The VIX, uh, bull break. So we were looking for anything above 20 as a bull break. Most of the move came on Friday, a 10-point advance. It's just below 30. Strongest weekly closing basis going all the way back to the beginning of the year. So... Over 30 basically means the market has sustained increased volatility. Watching very, very, very closely for that. Because VIX was so elevated and happened all in one shot, there wasn't really a lot of options activity. Options are now incredibly expensive. And we're going to look at that later when we go to the options review. Next things here are going to be XAU and BTC. So here we're looking at a monthly chart and also a weekly chart just because uh, there's a big decision here, right? Big decision this uh, next week. Uh, with a new monthly candle opening up and uh, the weekly looks like it is stuck but bullish over 1800 so looking here again monthly chart uh, we're going to be opening up next month if we can hold 1800 it'll be roughly the uptrend and then on the weekly chart we have an inverse head and shoulders here if we lose that 1760 area break on the monthly break on the um, uh, weekly and monthly and 
Uh, Goldman Sachs has been calling gold the poor man's crypto. So if the poor man's crypto also declines and bear breaks, I think the market's going to be confirming we're going lower. Why? Broad-based de-risking. XLU down, gold down, Bitcoin down, TNX down, right? Everything down. BTC. So BTC is now backtesting uh, roughly the 61% Fibonacci uh, retracement. And uh, that's at about uh, 54,000. So December 17th is the apex for this next week here, which just means where the dotted line meets the uptrend. And that is the debt ceiling deadline roughly of the 15th. Meaning, uh, what's going to happen? I think Bitcoin's going to take a cue on that debt ceiling move. And then we got QQQ on the daily chart here. Again, just looking and seeing that we got a double uptrend. We're right back here to a previous area that I was looking at really close. Before we backtest that 383 and the 50 MA curling up, just like S&P. Looking here now, the fear and greed index looks excellent. Why? If we're looking at dip buy, the market's nice and scared, right? Went from extreme greed right to fear pretty fast, right? Slice it in half from 64 to 31. It halved, right? Excellent. Excellent. I'm not looking at the daily, uh, daily heat map, uh, one day heat map. It is bright red for everything. What I'm doing instead is zooming out to a one week and one month performance. The one week looks pretty ugly. It's pretty unanimous. They're just selling everywhere. A couple pockets of green, but for the most part, it's pretty deep red, meaning negative five. Looking at the one month though, uh, one month looks fine. Uh, chips leading tech, tech leading spy. This looks fine to me, which means this next week is especially important, especially as we go into a new month. Um, there's clear rotation and chop happening here, though, right? It's obvious, right? Chop, 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 chop. Oh, yeah, travel's on, right? Oops, travel's shut down. All right, cool. Uh, moving forward. So now we're going to go to, uh, there's a couple extra threads here if you want to go through them. Uh, again, for members only, right? Algo, BTC versus ES. I got some really good notes on that if you want to go through and have a look. Uh, let's go through options. Then we'll have a quick look at SPY. So now we know the potential for where we could be going. Now let's look and see if there's any evidence on the options chains to give us a clue one way or the other. So here, here are the option chains for next week. And again, remembering that S&P dove down by 10 points and the VIX jacked up by about, by about 50%. So options are now incredibly expensive. They also provide a little bit of a window for what the break-even cost is for these areas. So looking here, what's notable is that we look at 463 and 458 as big strikes on the put side. And again, ironically, this 458 has roughly $4 in premium. So 458 minus four bucks is equal to 454, the previous all-time high. Ugh. There's also uh, there's also volume here and open interest at 4, 455. They're already positioned for this, right? Uh, pretty much the uh, last tradable options chain going into the end of the month. They're watching it close. Let me just double check that. Yeah, 1st of December. So they're ready for this. They're buying lots of roughly at the money and out of the money calls as well. All the way up to 466. Jerome Powell speaks. So again, people are placing bets. He speaks in the morning at 10 a.m. So, uh, right, let's see what happens. Uh, looking here at Wednesday, December 1st, uh, what I'm noticing here is that we got a 465, 455 uh, put op uh, open interest. So what does that mean? A uh, little bit of a spread and uh, open interest here at 465 and 455, which means Maybe we get that back test of the uh, previous all-time high on SPY and then maybe advance from there. This implies they don't want it below. That's why it's a spread. Uh, 460 is also going to be an important area here. And uh, the break-even on this again, 460 minus six bucks is what? 454. Oh, God. These ones here, though, the 455s are worth about four bucks, which means break-even at 451. Okay. Okay. Why? The VIX jacked up by literally uh, 50%. Huge move. Looking up to Friday, I see 460, 455 put spread again. This has pretty big interest here too, right? Pretty big volume, sorry. So we got about 50K and 40K. And this 458s are again priced at roughly, looking at the right one here. Here we go. Here's the, here, my, my apologies. Here is the one for Friday, in uh, the Friday, the December 3rd. So, 460 and 455, we got about, uh, again, it looks very similar to Monday where we got a lot of volume. So they're betting on Monday and then out to Friday. So looking here, we got uh, 460, 455 put spread and uh, we got 61,000 and 42,000. So all that means is that at uh, 455, the break even on these is gonna be below 450, which means we're gonna be losing that previous top. And then we got key areas on S&P charting we're gonna look at just after this. So again, if we lose that 454 on a weekly closing basis, 
Uh, we're probably going down to 430s. Yeah, 430s. Finally, what do we got here? We got the uh, um, December monthly chain. Yeah, right here. We got the December monthly. So muted, but some activity. What does that mean? Um, it's muted, but there's some activity here. So why? Because it's just so expensive. So there's again, there's a lot of open interest here already. We, we reviewed that last weekend. I didn't really see anything major coming in though. Why? Puts are so damn expensive. Uh, lots of uh, pretty much... Uh, 460 to 470 area being bought as well with the end of your target still being 470 so this all makes sense to me there's nothing really unusual i don't really see anything beyond this week which catches my attention looking at qqq now um it's pretty muted uh going into monday wednesday and friday of next week 395 sorry 393.85 put spread and again 383 is that previous all-time high on qqq so very important here very similar uh, very similar to s&p uh, same thing here. We got 394 and 384. Oh, God, right? Yeah. A put spread implies they wanted to close at the low end of the range. 384. What would that be? Just above the previous all time high. Interesting. And then here for Friday, again, what do we have? We got 390. Open interest with volume of five bucks. What's the break even? 385. 385, right? Just again, that same area. QQQ monthly, uh, muted. What is that? Again, no one really wants to bet one way or the other. Why? Uh, waiting to see what Jerome Powell has to say. Muted on, the, muted on the reports as well. Perfect. All right, finally, let's have a look at uh, S&P analysis. This is the last one here. At about 36 minutes, I just had a lot to review for for the economic calendar. If you're still enjoying the stream or the video, please smash a thumbs up. And again, drop me a comment. I would really appreciate it. Uh, I feel like I'm really getting better at doing these weekend deep dives, and I hope you're enjoying watching them too. All right, nasty break here. Uh, this is the uh, seasonal chart template we've been looking at. One, two, three, four, massive dub, and then all the way up. So we got a dub, we got an M. Nice. That's a massive, that's a massive, massive cut. Yuck, yuck, yuck. So the M is here. We've completed it. The question is, are we going to go back to that previous top? Again, roughly 454. 4540 on SPX, the index. <coughs> We can also see the 50 MA here at 453. Basically, it's going to curl up a little bit more and basically meet that previous top into this week. Looking at SPY, again, we're still in a massive funnel here. So again, uh, bottom, top, bottom, top, top, bottom, top. Oh my God, why do we not hold the top? Well, we're going lower. So what does that mean? We're going lower. Bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom. Mm, maybe. Oh, maybe. Yeah. 430s, right? 440s, 430s. Yeah, maybe. Can't hold this here. Yeah, maybe. We're going to look at the monthly chart to confirm it. So now we look forward here again. The potential for us to move down is not uh, that unreasonable. Monthly chart now, again, this is going to be opening up uh, new uh, back to unchanged. So we close the uh, the month out. Sorry, as of right now, if we were to close the month out, we're down by about 28 cents on a $460 stock. It's not really all that much, but a 10 point reversal does signal the potential for more. Uh, new month opens up on Wednesday. Again, Jerome, Jerome Powell will have already spoken twice before then and scheduled to speak again on Wednesday. So what that means is that is 458 going to act as support or resistance? Why? Uh, if we don't hold that uh, 458, then we got 45250, which is our monthly close and open. And then below that, we got 438, right? That's the 430, 430 range. Also lines up with roughly here, right? Roughly, roughly between 435 and 440. Oh, that math stuff. Yeah, the math stuff. All right, looking at the weekly chart now. Not a lot of volume. Um, all things considered, not a lot of volume. 460 back test. Uh, next thing below that, next thing below that's going to be 454, and then below that we got roughly 445 as the next top if we match the DIA, NYSC, and IWM pattern. Why? Spy is going to be the last domino to fall after QQQ slides. So again. Uh, mid 440s down to high 430s is definitely possible. Is it probable? I have no idea. What I do know is that the daily chart here is telling us that by Wednesday or the beginning of the month, we're going to be getting a key decision starting to just go sideways, which is, uh, is going to mean that we're going to break that downtrend. All we got to do is be above 454, 455 by Wednesday close. And we're going to be confirming that move, which means, again, let's kind of get that move out of the way here. Maybe into the first half of the week, we can test down to 454 and then advance off of that. Oh, 
That's what I'm looking for. Again, I'm looking at 454 or that previous all-time high, watching it really close in the Wednesday close after Powell has spoken one, two, three, up to four times. Yeah. 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 Meaning all the takeaway. Let's see what happens by the close of the month. Uh, also, again, the 50 DMA or the yellow line is also going to be curling up to roughly meet it into this week, just like on SPX. Finally, the hourly chart, which we were using as our sell signal from last week. So again, the 161% extension got hit and then it faded. So what does that mean? The dotted line. Uh, we take the top, the bottom, get a Fibonacci extension, boom, hit it and dumped. So if we can't hold that area, 456, 454, and 452 are support. Big buy into the close as well here, right? They bought that baby up nice and hard. I think that's it. So I want to thank you guys for tuning in. I would really appreciate your support this week with smashing the thumbs up, uh, dropping a comment, and again, subscribing to the channel if you enjoy the content. I'm trying to get better every week. Let me know what you think. Am I doing a good job? Do you feel prepared? And most importantly, are we buying or are we selling? Thank you again for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next weekend.